It was uh, it was a bizarre day. Um, we were doing some uh, hand-to-hand combat training with uh, a guy named Tony Blauer, great guy. And uh, guy comes up the stairs. We were on a loft area. Guy comes up the stairs and says, uh, a plane just hit the towers. I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, maybe it's observation plane. Nobody said a word about, you know, what kind of plane. Was it a helicopter? Was it a fixed wing? Mm -hmm. Observation plane? Was it whatever? Nobody knew. What was it, 10 minutes later? He comes back up the stairs and says, second plane hit the tower. We're under attack. And then everything changed. Everything changed. And it was complete chaos, honestly. For for me, my perspective, you know, I'm like, what was I, fuck six? I was like, fuck four. I was like, I don't know, it was five. I was probably five on the team out of a a five-man team. I was a nobody. Um, But it was just bizarre. It was mayhem. It was report after report of another airplane being, you know, for well, obviously that wasn't the, that was just the beginning. Then it was the Pentagon. Then it was uh, Flight 93 into the ground. Um, You know, we just were going kind of crazy. And then in the end of the evening, the end of the day, um, there were more alerts. There were constant alerts. And then all of Fort Bragg was like a giant traffic jam. You couldn't get back in. Um, so a lot of us stayed there and we had to, def- we even defended the gates. Um, it was very, very interesting. Yeah, it was very bizarre. Um, once all the dust really settled and then it was time to figure out how to strike back. And, uh, so somebody developed the plan and we put it in action and, um, uh, it was the longest air assault raid in the history of uh, warfare. And uh, it was, uh, it was almost, it was almost, uh, man, it was almost anticlimactic, actually. Uh, uh, I don't know if the pre fire missions made everybody go on the ground, but pretty much uh, there was nothing on target. Pretty mm. much nobody was there. Everybody had de- departed. Um, but it was, uh, it was good. You know, it was, uh, well, when you guys, so when you guys flew in, what'd you fly in on? 47. Okay. And what was your first target? Mullah Omar's compound. Yep. And Okay. Okay. And nobody was there. Ah, oh, man, that had to be kind of a bummer. Like, all right, well, fuck. It was bizarre. It was like going through a training target. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Man, so, I mean, within a month, you guys are boots on the ground, you know. That's got to be, like, a great feeling, though, knowing that you're part of the guys that are getting to go back, like, immediately. Like, you're one of the first guys there, you know. Did you guys link up with Northern Alliance and and work with those guys initially, or was it, no, just straight missions? Somebody else. Okay. Can you talk any more? I mean, what, what else can you tell us about that? I can, I can tell you it was uh, uh, there's a book by name a guy named Ralph Peters who was the uh, on scene commander at Desert One. He wrote a book called The Guts to Try. Uh, the Guts to Try comes from English pilots working for the government of Oman who came to the came to the site where the aircraft came back onto Jazarat Masira. Um, and they threw him a case of beer out of a, a pinky or a Land Rover or whatever. A pinky is what we call them. And in the dust on the top of the case of beer, it said to all of you from all of us for having the guts to try. So Jazarat Masira is where we flew out of. So that was a, that was a key thing for me. I was a big historian. I'm, I'm an amateur historian is what I call myself. Uh, I knew about that. And that was a big thing for me. Um, again, it was the longest air assault raid in history. I peed three times on the way there and threw the bags out the window. Um, I was an assistant breacher at the time. Uh, our breach was meant to put a hole in the wall. Uh, obviously that's important. If, if you don't get in, you don't do anything. Um, I don't think I've ever even talked about this openly ever. Um, Uh, landing was, was a little chaotic. Um, 
looking out before landing, flying. So you're flying not by the earth, right? For those of you who don't know that, you're getting as close as you can to terrain. Uh, when we flew over one particular hill, there was a gun truck there and it was shooting at us actively. You could see that there was uh, tracers in the air coming right for you. And it was very interesting to see that out of the back end of the of the aircraft. And it was, you know, when you're wearing night vision goggles, the night vision goggles technology has changed right now. You, white phosphorus technology is a different scene, right? Back then it was a uh, green and black. Uh, you, I, almost all my career, you know, almost all my career I fought in green and black. So um, you were just, you're just sitting there looking outside of it, you know, really, you're really looking back out of the back end of a, of a fuselage of an airplane. This is a helicopter in this case, but it's a big square like a TV. And you're looking out there seeing this gun truck shooting uh, at you. Um, and you're like, wow, that's, uh, that's the real deal. <laughs> that's the real when, we deal. Landed, when we landed, we took some, uh, we took some fire. Uh, it wasn't real coordinated fire. It was no, I don't remember ever being in any kind of real danger. Uh, there was shots on the wall. I remember shots impacting the wall that we were going to breach. Uh, it wasn't, I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on making sure that the prop stick was uh, secure on the charge and secure on the ground so that the uh, giant charge wouldn't fall off. Uh, stuff like that. You weren't concerned about anything else. You need to be focused on this one thing here before, I, you know, before you make entry. Um, and then later on, we had uh, one of the aircraft that was damaged. Uh, it landed on part, a portion of a wall. Some of the landing gear was damaged. Um, we had to do it, you know, we had to execute a bump plan, uh, but no big, no real big deal. But when we got to exfiltration, we finished the building structure, numerous structures inside the large structure. When we finished, uh, we were at a gate. I'll never forget it ever. We're at a gate getting ready for Xville, and you could hear uh, the enemy firing rockets. And a friend of mine looked at me and said, what's that? I said, rockets. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear them. Whoosh, 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 you know, and there were sort of the rockets. But not, nothing really effective. You know, most of the your JTAC guys, not your guys, but my, my JTAC fellows on the roof uh, working uh, DAPs and other aircraft. Uh, attacking targets in the in the hills. That's what. So whether the enemy had left in tunnels or they had moved off prior, either way, and now that they were they were shooting stuff at us from our remote locations and whatnot. So to me, the one of the most nervous portions was because I knew history, uh, especially about Desert One, was sitting somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the desert. I don't even know where we were, and refueling, and thinking this is where this is where the helicopter collided with the C-130 here in Desert One, you know, and uh, please not, let's not do it now. <laughs> uh, and then flew back uh, and then inspected the holes in the uh, airframe when we got back. So pretty, it was pretty, uh, pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, again, once in a lifetime thing, you know, that's one of those things that millions and millions and millions of Americans would have gladly stepped into that spot you know, to go do that within a month after September 11th. Like people don't remember uh, that, you know, people that were too young or weren't born yet. It's like, uh, it's, it was just a crazy time. Like you were saying earlier on in the show, like it, people were so together afterwards, you know, that people wanted some kind of revenge and knowing that there was like these terrorist training camps and all this stuff coming out of Afghanistan, you know, that's a really uh, interesting perspective. Obviously, did you guys, what was the intelligence like? You know, this is, the first days literally of the war, you know, this is also people don't may forget because it's such a commonplace thing now, but this was like the very beginning of like drones, you know, our very first models of, of predator drones were out there. So it's not like we had these crazy, like, you know, uh, I don't know, Intel pieces flying around, giving you real time data all the time. So what was it like for you guys? Did you have, I mean, maps imagery, did you know what you were going into or was it kind of a very general, scenario so first and foremost from my position not my concern right tell me where to go and i will tell you a funny story uh a buddy of mine billy and i would we'd you know maybe echo five echo six whatever where we download you know blah 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 where's the breach 
Yeah. I don't care about anything else. Just tell me where the breach is. Let me get it done. That's not, that's a, obviously a hyperbolic view of it. It's not what we would think at all in the end, but uh, Intel was the way I remembered it. Intel was come say, come saw. And it was, it, none of it was easy. Those guys did a great job filtering through everything in the end. Uh, we had a great uh, picture of this particular compound. And then we, we made uh, not just a sand table, but we made a model. Someone had made a model of this thing. Uh, I remember briefing it, uh, briefing. I remember it going to the briefing, you know, talking about this thing. Um but our, you know, my particular job wasn't focused on that. My particular job was teaching someone how to make sure they were shooting machine gun correctly, or, or the again the, the the breach and and making sure that the uh, the charge was right and uh, working with my team and and finding out which way we're going to clear and blah 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 stuff like that. It wasn't I let that, you know, I'm very comfortable again jaded, right? So you knew you had the best people working on this, so I'm completely comfortable with doing my job because somebody else is doing their job very well. And so uh, from an Intel perspective, I can't tell you much about it. I don't know much about it other than, other than you know, before we ever launched, it was haphazard. It was like I told you before the days of, and, and then, and then the 12th, yeah. the 13th, 14th, there were some crazy days. There were, you know, nobody knew anything. It was, it, there was rumors upon ru- rumors and, you know, it was kind of bizarre. Um, but, and it's a, and it's a different time where, I mean, even everyone having cell phones was not a thing. No, there was no such thing as a smartphone. There was no such thing as like walking around with tablets with maps and and stuff like that. There was no, the internet existed, but it wasn't like shit. I think you could still probably do AOL in two thousand one. You know what I'm saying? I oh, think yeah, that I, was still yeah, a I, thing. Yeah, I think I had my first. I think I had a, a Motorola Razor flip phone still Fuck in two thousand seven. Yeah. <laughs> also, there we go, brother. Pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking reason. Worst signal ever. somebody making fun of me. What is that? I'm like, dude, this is badass. I'm like, you kidding me? Uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, so to a degree, you're right. You know, it, was, it wasn't like that anymore. But, you know, I do remember working with other task force partners. It was great. And we later on, we worked after that particular piece was finished. Uh, and we high fived and said, "Great, yippee skippy, not done yet." You know, we got we have a lot more to do, so yeah, it's time to time to get back into the desert and uh, start working them uh, one day at a time. How did things change? Because you were still with them, you know, you're still in JSOC for many years after that, for a while after that. How did things change? Where this is a situation where you're going in with a limited perspective, limited technology, you know to like let's say the last couple of years that you were in or that you were operating like how did things change within the unit tactics gear and stuff like did it did you see like a a massive shift in anything no i would say more like an overton window you know more like this just this gradual change that probably happened quicker than a regular overton window type of scenario but um yeah, just things just started changing. You just, hey, can you teach me about this Bluetooth? Hey, can let's let's do this. You know, let's talk about these things. I remember in uh, Southwest Asia, somewhere in the Euphrates River Valley, I had a computer on my chest, mm-hmm. and I had a small Bluetooth attachment on my shoulder, which now I would flip down and go, okay, that's where I am right there. Yeah, I get it. And so, you know, b- before, but but regular stuff is you know, as a regular map, as a regular uh, grid reference maps and whatnot. And, you know, that stuff never changes. That stuff all, you know, continues to be correct. But the you know, technology started to, to to come in. And, you know, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about weapons technology. Uh, you mentioned the Javelin. But how about from a particular shooter user perspective when the ammunition changed? Because, you know, M855 green tip, not so hot. You know, we need to get a better kind of ammunition that has better terminal ballistics when it comes to entering flesh and and not exiting flesh when we're in a close quarter battle situation, things like that. So all that stuff changed, you know, the thermobaric grenades changed. Uh, uh, There's, there's a whole lot of technology that changed that again, from my perspective was more like an Overton window where all of a sudden it was just there. Okay, sure. Fine. Let's use that or a new radio or a new uh, jamming technique. Uh, uh, something like that where, you know, all of our trucks had jammers in them, you mm-hmm. know, first in the, in the beginning, the trucks didn't have the kind of armor we wanted. And then all of a sudden there was uh, 
somebody said, well, a good idea. Fairy shows up and says, well, why don't we put armor on the inside? It's like a, a level three to protect from a spalling. If the, if the outside of the, the vehicle gets hit and it made sense. And, you know, you just you trial and error though was also part of it. There's a lot of trial and error. So, so tactics, techniques, and procedures throughout military history always change For sure. with each day that you meet the enemy on, on the battlefield. How much, how much did you see the stuff that you guys were trying out and perfecting trickle down to the big army? Almost.